Welcome back to The Francisca Show, a Jewish coffeehouse podcast where we encourage fellow artists and entrepreneurs to collaborate and support each other while sharing their stories. I am Francisca, a singer, composer, music producer, coach, and also your host. Thank you so much for joining and listening to this podcast. I look at the numbers and I am so impressed by how so many of you are still checking in even with everything that's going on. I'd like to also mention that ModMath Now is offering make your own home kit. So if you are looking to straighten your teeth now is a great time, especially because other beauty services aren't really available to you right now. So this is something you can do to improve your smile. And hopefully when this is all over, you'll have something to show for it. So if you're interested, please reach out to one eight four four modmouth and that's one eight four four modmouth and make sure to tell them Francisca sent you. And stay tuned till the end of the show where I will announce my announcements I've been talking about for the last few weeks and also have in mind that I was very tired and very pregnant during this interview. So please don't judge if you're watching this on YouTube. <laughs> uh, yeah, enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'd like to welcome you back and thank you again so much for listening. Today on the show with, uh, with us, we have Ilana Greenspan, who is a singer, songwriter, music producer. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so great to have you. This is our second attempt at this interview and not not the actual interview, but we've tried to do this a few months back. And as I believe, the interviews happen at the right time. So there was a reason we didn't do the interview when we scheduled it or originally. And I'm thrilled to have you on the show finally. I've met you at that TAR conference, so this is so nice. Thanks. It's great to talk to you, too. So let's start with uh, the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, how you started and got involved in the arts. Uh, I grew up in Jericho, Long Island. We actually just sold my mom's house yesterday. Congrats. So I lived, you know, had that my whole life. And now it's like a new chapter. Um, and I, my, I was always very musical. So my mom started me on lessons on keyboard. And when I was eight, I would always get bored of like once I got to theory and stuff I just wanted to play and so I wrote my first little song when I was eight I didn't know that I wrote it and that's how a lot of my songs still are I don't realize that I wrote it because um, it sounds like it's probably exists but then it turns out that it doesn't um, and then I made it up so it's it's like because I hear it it's it comes down automatically a lot of it so then um, I just kind of reproduce what was put in my head so it's kind of free gifts, a lot of it. It's like free gifts, and then I have to work hard to flesh out the rest of the idea. Um, like, that's the process, basically. So um, the, then I played guitar when I was 15. I took lessons. And then after I was divorced, actually, then I kind of went crazy taking drum lessons. I bought a stand-up bass and taught myself how to play that. I knew how to play bass guitar. I bought a I bought a um, a banjo, and learned how to play that. I I started taking violin le violin lessons, so now I can play that. So I play about ten instruments all together, like some of them better, some of them less. But I found that the trick is to just if you play with confidence, even if it's Mary had a little lamb, people think that you can really play that instrument. But all you can play is Mary had a little lamb. But it's fine, because you can make Mary Had a Little Lamb sound really good, even if you're a beginner. So, Very true. So you took us across your instrumental, or the instruments biography a little bit, or mm -hmm. um, history. So you have learned music throughout your childhood, and what came after that? I didn't go to school formally for music, even though I really wanted to. And I have I was good friends with people from I went to Binghamton. So I have, I have two good friends still from Binghamton that graduated from the music department and they both work in music. My mom thought you can't get a job in music, but I think you can. I wish I had done that. But uh, when I then I, after college, I played in bars and clubs and stuff in Manhattan where I lived. And it was really fun. And I started to get really good at it. And I was going to 
I had to make a decision after about a year and a half or so where I sort of peaked like at where what I was doing when sort of the open mic scene and like some paid gigs like at bars and clubs down there. I was like in the East Village in Manhattan. And so I had to decide, am I going to take this more pro, you know, and really do this or go in some other direction? So there were a couple things stopping me from going more pro and pushing it there. Um, things that wasn't really aware of at the time, but just a weird feeling. One of the weird feelings was after a set, like strange guys would come up and shake my hand and I had to shake their hand cause that was normal. And they would like look in my eyes and I see that they like knew who I was, which they did cause they'd see me on stage. Um, and then I would, you know, and they would talk to me and I, I just, that encounter, I, which that repeatedly made me feel very weird. Like, like I'm really putting myself out there and I, and I didn't care when women would come up to me. I had no concept of SNES or anything like that, but there was this weird feeling of like, do I really want to put myself out there like that in front of guys? You know, I felt a little weird about that. Did you grow up religious? No, I didn't grow up religious. Okay. I grew up secular. I went to public school. I had some Jewish education when I was small. And then there was like, I went to Salman Schefter, kindergarten through second grade, but it was completely a secular, you know, like environment as far as friends and everything. Right. So, yeah. So that, so like my, so I, but, but SNEAS, it turns out really affected my decision to not pursue a career in performing at that, that time. And that was an inner calling. That was an inner feeling. I didn't know what SNEAS, right. I didn't know from SNEAS. I just knew that like, do I really want to put myself out there? I feel kind of awkward about that. And the other the other issue was also related eventually to, to why I did Shuba. And I started becoming from in that environment, actually, was that I was looking around and there were, you know, I was with like comedians and actors and, and musicians and everyone was like in their 20s, 30s and even 40s. And no one was married. And nobody, that wasn't important to anybody. And I knew that I, I knew that having a Jewish family would be, was really important to me. I had a strong Jewish identity. I wanted that. So I was like, mm, if I do this, that's not really going to like lead to what I want as far as, you know, long term in my life. And I was in my 20s. So I, I just felt, you know, it was those two pieces that kept me from going for it. There was one time where I performed on stage and um, Amy Poehler was there. She's a she's a Saturday Night Live comedian and who's now a you know a famous comedian and movies and things. So she was there. I opened that night. It was at this place called uh, Baby Jupiter, and I had this crazy funny set because I ended up accidentally breaking my tooth on stage with my guitar. I was putting it over my head, and I like bumped my tooth, and all of a sudden, I'm an, I'm standing in front of 250 people on a stage, and I feel my for my front tooth crumble inside of my mouth and I'm standing in front of everyone and I was like oh my gosh should I just walk off the stage because but instead I went with it and I just told everybody what had just happened and I went on to this whole thing about how I was just going to perform as like as like a hillbilly with half a tooth and so it turned out very funny and I got off the stage and after Amy's set she performed with her stand up with her um, sketch comedy group Upright Citizens Brigade and she saw me after, and I was in this, like, girl conversation circle with, with her and uh, Janine Garofalo and this other woman who I didn't know. Janine Garofalo is a, also a well-known comedian. And uh, they were like, oh, you were really funny. I was like, oh, thanks. And then, like, I felt like I felt like uh, the nerd at school that suddenly gets noticed by the really popular girls. And I just, like, then I didn't want them to see that my – my tooth was half missing, so I felt uncomfortable having the conversation. So I was just like, oh, thanks. And then I booked out of there. <laughs> but that's one of those times I think, like, that was so dumb. But I just hung out with those women. They just, like, wanted to hang out with me because they liked me. You know, who knows what kind of opportunities may have opened up. But it wasn't, you know, the other the other pieces were still present for me, like the he other hesitations. So, but, yeah, that was kind of a fun little brush with she wasn't famous yet, but you could see she was going to be because she was so talented. So you were playing at bars and doing stand-up, and right? Is there anything else I'm missing from that part No, that's of basically it. I wasn't really doing stand-up per se, but when I had my guitar, 
When I have my guitar in front of me, I seem to be funny, even if I didn't write material. Sometimes I will write material. I am working on that, like, you know, stand-up material. And, that, and it comes off just as, like, people don't even realize that I wrote it because it's very natural. But um, it's more, it's more, it mu it's music, and then um, it becomes funny. Okay, so what happens after that? Take us through that journey. I started a process of, uh, you know, meeting the right people in the right time. As far as you know, becoming influenced to uh, start learning about about Judaism, and after about six months of like doing like a chavrusa program, like a one on one, like learning, you know, Jewish learning program, I decided to become Shomer Shabbos. That became important to me, and then I learned about Kolisha, you know, which is that we don't perform, we don't sing in front of men. So it was really devastating. I thought it was like a terrible death sentence, like. A, a mistake, like a curse. Because I was like, how could Hashem give you a big talent and then you're not supposed to use it? Or like, people would say, no, no, you could use it just in front of women. And I would say, but that's really lame. That's like super lame. So one time, it was like, people would try to influence me. They say, oh, well, this woman's performing at my friend's um, living room. Let me take you. Okay. So we pay like $15 to walk into this woman's living room, which was really weird. And then this woman is singing. And she had a beautiful voice. She was very talented. But I began to cry because I was so depressed that this is the future of women's performing is I'm going to perform in somebody's living room. Like, no, for eight people. Like, you can't do that after you've been in front of an audience, you know, in a public and experience that and then, and then take it into people's living rooms and feel like you're going to be satisfied that way. No way. So I was, like, crying from that. And some, some condescending person pats me on the back and and says, oh, it's it's beautiful, isn't it? And I wanted to, like, turn around and punch her and be like, N no, that's not what this is about. This is about the, how sad this all is, you know? <laughs> this is so sad. So then I, then I decided, well, I needed to go away to learn. So I went to Israel for a year. I learned at Nishmat. And to learn what I was doing as a, as an observant person. And while I was there, so before I went away, I said, look, I'm, I'm totally into this. I've decided this is going to be my life. I believe in this. I want this. There's only two things I'm never going to do. I'm never going to cover my hair when I get married because I have, you know, really pretty, curly, long hair. And I'm never going to observe Kolisha. Like, those two things are for the birds, not for me. But I was there for a year giving everything a full chance. And so I, I went to the I was living, I was in Yerushalayim. I went to the Pargod Theater, which is on Rehov Batsala. In Nachlaot. And I walked in there and I spoke to the proprietor there, Arye. I don't remember his last name. And I said, this was in 1999. So there wasn't anything going on, like with women performing. I said, let me have this, let me have the room like once a month and only women are allowed in. And everyone pays to come in and whoever wants gets eight minutes on the stage. I based this off an open mic that I used to go to in the village. And he said, okay, he had no idea if it was going to be successful. I had no idea. I got the word out to seminaries and, like, you know, mainly, like, the English-speaking, you know, Yerushalayim population, which is big. And we had our first show, and there were, like, close to 100 people there and, like, 30 performers. And then it just grew every month. It was featured in all the, all the English-speaking publications at that time jerusalem report jerusalem post all the there were like two more and it was instantly successful with the women and the, and the main thing that was important for me was that it was instantly successful for me i was fully expecting a nerdy experience like the one at somebody's living room but the space was cool and i was really doing it for myself just to have a place to perform for women only that was cool enough for me um and I was shocked because I got on stage and instead of being this nerdy thing, it was the coolest thing ever. And it was cooler than performing even for mixed audiences because I realized as I was performing for the women only that when you're performing for a mixed group, even if you're not aware of it, part of you is playing to men. Part of you is playing to the fact that they think you're attractive or cute or whatever it is, even though my act was never like, a, you know, any. It wasn't an overtly, like, you know, appealing to guys type of act. It was just me and my funny songs. But without them there, I realized that there was that kind of haze. 
going on and that I hadn't been aware of. And I suddenly it was just about me and the art and and the audience, you know, receiving it and appreciating it. So it was so much more pure on an artistic level that it was a huge eye opener for me. And I realized, oh, okay, if you get the right venue, this isn't nerdy at all. It's cooler, actually, than performing for men and women. So the show was very successful the whole year that I was there. And there were a bunch of seminary girls there that were so inspired by it that they asked to have a meeting with me where I could teach them what I was doing so they could take it back to their cities with them. So I had a, a girl from Baltimore and a girl from Toronto and a girl from South Africa even. And there were a few more places. And they were all intent on starting their own open mics. So actually, there's still one going on from that. It's um, Leslie Ginsberg Klein in Baltimore still does wi- Girls' Night On or Women's Night On, something yeah. like that. We had her on the show. Great. So yeah. she, I'm the grandma of that show. That's awesome. She, um, she started that after that meeting. So it's exciting. According to what people say, mine was the first official, you know, women's open mic for from women. Before that, there was like Tofa Ah, which was not an open mic. That was just you would come out and see Tofa Ah. Tofa Ah is, is just the name of the band that exists in Israel, where it's like a rotating band and different women come in and play. And they would just have performances once in a while where you could go see them. That was all I was aware of, of like a running show for women. But that was you came as an audience member. You didn't. You know, so that so the women's open mic in Israel in 1999 was the first one. And then I think basically all the open mics after that are you know, that was like the, the mother of them all. So that's exciting to have started that. And uh, yeah, that was that was a great contribution and fun. And, and it was eye opening for me. And then at the end of my year in Israel, I was on board with both Kolisha and, you know, eventually when I got married, covering my hair, because I'd spent the whole year looking at these amazing women who were teaching me I covered their hair, and by the end of it, I was—I understood the reasons, and I said, "Yeah, I want to be like that." So, I came to—I came to peace with those two things that I had a big issue with at the outset. Music was a, you know, a big part of that. That's interesting, but you—you you did talk about a little bit how you had that innate experience of awkwardness when you did perform for mixed audiences. So I feel like somehow maybe came full circle to you what I'm trying to say is there are women who become from and uh, observant and they don't come around to that but I think you had that innate feeling of that wasn't something you were so comfortable with so you were able to connect back to that when you were holding there on an intellectual level the pieces were fit oh really there's this concept of sneas and and not really you know modest for me to perform in front of men okay well I understand that because I felt weird by putting myself out there like that so that did satisfy that and it made sense too because every every woman really I don't even it's not exclusive to Jewish women I think every woman has an innate sense of of modesty you know even a woman who's wearing like a, a micro mini skirt you'll see her tugging it down and it's like well what's the point of that but she doesn't want like you know higher showing you know than what's showing so i think we everyone has a sense of of modesty so it did speak to that like when i learned about it in that it existed as a whole as a whole way of protecting women i just you know with my upbringing in this outer society of like intense feminist values it was intellectually hard to accept that you know I had a lot of preconceived notions about Judaism being anti-women also to work through. So once I got it all, you know, lined up in the right context, that context really being me, I realized, and not, and not like, what will people think? And, you know, how does this, how does this clash with, you know, the way I was raised or whatever it was, it, it all lined up where it was like a, an organic, seamless identity for me that made sense, that felt good about yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to transition into your master's degree that you did at bar University. Sure. So I was always really a creative writer, more than a musician, because my mom kind of didn't think I would be able to work in in music. So so I was always a writer, and I, I published a children's book with Simon Schuster 
in 2000. It's called It's Great to Skate. I was an easy guy to inline skating because I'm a big skater. Um, and I was just in the right place at the right time to get that book published because I worked for a, a literary agent in Manhattan at the time when I was also performing in bars and clubs. So I was always a writer. And then later, years later, when I got, when I was married and I had a baby, I heard somebody told, oh, it was my husband at the time. He brought home from the base medrash uh, an advertisement for this brand new master's degree program that was starting for creative writing. And he was like, this is perfect for you. Also, I was under 30. And when you make, and we had made Aliyah. So when you make Aliyah and you're under 30, they'll pay, the government will pay for your master's degree. So they paid for my master's degree. I actually ended up getting paid for it because I had honors. I graduated with honors and they give you something for that. So I had a baby in the middle of that. It was a two-year program and I had a baby on year two. So I foolishly picked all women. I picked all women professors because I felt like they're going to let me bring my baby to class and nurse in the class. He was like, he was like six weeks old, like no bother. You just keep him, you know, latched on the whole day. No one's going to hear a peep. <laughs> but it turns out that you ha if you want that, you have to pick male professors because women professors left their babies at home. Professor calls me up to the desk and she's like, um, you're going to leave your baby home next time, right? And I was like, oh, I picked all women professors thinking you guys would understand, you know, but no. Then I spoke to my my uh, my advisor, who was a guy. He was like, I would have let you nurse in class. Like, you should have picked male professors. So just a note to anybody trying to get away with bringing a nursing baby to class, pick male professors. They have much more rahmanas. The women are career women. They left their babies home. So anyway, I finished, I did that master's and I wrote a novel. That's great I advice. Got, yeah, it's really, because the guys can't judge you. They'll but just, I, I think that's only in Israel, though. In America, no, in I America, think, probably nobody would bring. You're, or you're expected to leave the room and go to a nursing room or bathroom. Well, bathroom is terrible, but if there's a nursing room. I'm no? sorry about that. I think, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I, I didn't, when I had babies in America, I wasn't in a situation where I had, was going to school or working. So right. I didn't have to deal with that. But if you are, pick guys. <laughs> They're much more understanding because they can't understand. So they just assume it must be okay if you're doing that. So let's go back to your master's. So I did it. It was two years. It was intense. It was like, it was really an MFA. But because of logistical, like, bureaucratic reasons, they had to make it an MA. But it's really an MFA. It's the same thing. And I, I came out with a novel that I wrote, and I had I had representation for it right away. And it wasn't accepted for publication, so I've it's been shelved ever since. And I still want to get back to it and publish it because I really believe in it. I think it could be a very exciting book. It's fiction. Absolutely. So from writing, you went on to record your own albums, open your own studio, and perform everywhere from women's open mics that we talked about, but also these places where new moms go, postpartum oh, right. yeah, hotels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about that journey, how you went more into the production end of it. I think it's so interesting. If, if I may, it's a very practical way for somebody who creates content be able to produce it on their own as well right yeah it was born of a need to not have to pay other people all the time for me to make my songs when the songs come at a rate that you almost that you can't keep up with I still can't keep up with it I mean I have I have probably a hundred voice notes on my phone of just tunes that come into my mind with words or without both a lot of times they come in with like stupid words you know that I know it's just like a Fillers. You know, fillers. And then I'm going to save that tune when I need something later. So I, I don't, I don't record even a, I don't know, a fraction of what I, of what I hear. Uh, so basically I was forced into learning how to record because I worked at, I worked at a camp in the summer, Camp Rananu. And my boss like plopped me in front of a Mac and was like, 
I need you to record a song for me. And I was like, but I don't know how. He's like, well, you're going to learn it. And he left, <laughs> left the room. <laughs> so I had to figure it out. So I started like that. And then, and then I was like, wait, you know, it was very painful for me to force myself to learn technology. I think any woman who's like, oh, I don't know technology or, oh, I'm not good at, you know, anything technical. I was certainly one of those people is, is going to just sit there and start to like sweat profusely. And then, then I realized, okay, I have to do this. This is my job. My boss is expecting this. So I, you know, put one foot in front of the other and learned how to do it on a Mac. I wasn't a Mac person yet. So when I went home, I found a, a program called Mixcraft. So I very bumblingly, you know, forced myself through the process of learning, you know, everything there is to know, uh, as far as I got to at this point. And then later I, I switched to Mac and I, yeah, I recorded two albums on my dining room table using, you know, high quality home recording studio equipment. Um, and it was a great experience. I did it while my kids were napping. I did it while my kids were asleep at night. Sometimes I did it while they were awake because I used them in the in the recordings. They're cute little voices. So I, I cut my teeth learning on those two. I actually made the two albums at the same time. I just came up with like over 20 songs. So then I just divided them into two albums. I, one was a, a children's album and one was like a, you know, teenage, you know, and woman album, I guess. And uh, that's how I learned. And then, and then I continue to, I continue now to keep refining, you know, growing my skill set with it because you just, you have to keep up with, you know, technology and you have to keep up with more advanced and professional recording techniques and, and composing techniques. I'm now forcing myself to learn how to write my own drum, write my own drum uh, lines, Jeez. my own drum tracks. Yeah, I mean, I could do it manually. I'd rather just play the drums. But then when you get into the studio, when you get into the box, rather, when you get into your recording equipment and you see you're not lined up exactly, you have, you have to be lined up exactly so that it's professional sounding. So now I'm forcing myself to to learn that. But yeah. after I learn it, it'll be, it won't be as big a deal. It's always like that. Before I learn something, it's like, oh, another thing? Don't I know enough? But the answer is no. <laughs> you never You can never know enough. Yeah. And so people hear, heard about your album and then invited you to perform and or or hired you to do their sounds, their projects. Could you tell me more had, about that, how you transitioned? Had, sure. So I, a, a friend of mine who was, who's a comedian was working at this Kim Paternheim, this new mother baby hotel that opened up in Monroe. This was 12 years ago. And she suggested me as a performer. So I've been working there ever since I go there once, once every two weeks, like two or three times a month. So I perform there my own solo set. And then from there, I get a lot of, a lot of calls for parties in Brooklyn, a lot and Muncie and, you know, all over the tri-state area, five towns. And then I also perform with um, a band of girls I bring up high school girls because that's the only ones that have like energy and time to keep up like with me like I guess I perform and uh I want to do it I don't all the time you know and if I've tried to approach other moms that want that are musicians and they don't you know they don't prioritize that so they're like oh I don't have time oh that's you know what am I going to do that and what about my kids and I'm like who cares about your kids <laughs> you know just do it it's like there's nothing more fun you know, than like that and like maybe playing on a sports team for me, yeah. you know, so, so I still go up there. I still bring up my teenage girls with them. I do a completely different set than I do when I'm by myself. Um, you know, it's more like kumzets and I get to play drums. So that's really fun. So, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm so, doing now. And then I, then people come to me to, to record, uh, They'll come. A woman just came this week. She they rewrote the words to a song for her husband for his for his birthday, and she had like she had her six kids here, and they were all taking turns behind the mic singing their line, and then I you know patched it together for them, and and then you know auto tuned it and smoothed it out and gave it a polish, and and now they have this beautiful song that they wrote for their father and husband, and they made a video for it, and it's. It's really nice to be part of people's happy moments. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. 
I'd love to ask you about the financial aspect of what you do. Uh, is it rewarding? Is it, do you feel valued at, you know, your prices? Are people negotiating you down? Or do you feel like you have your rate and people pay it and that you're thrilled with um, what you're earning from your skills and talents? That's a great question. I think everybody wants to know that, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> right. So it's been, I've, I've had, a, I've hit a plateau the last few years where it doesn't seem to matter how much time and effort I put in. I have maxed out at a certain amount. And it's, it's, it's a substantial amount as far as like a part-time job, but it's definitely a part-time salary. I'd like to see that be higher, it, but it's, it's something supplemental. It's something, it's like an extra, it's an extra, you know, it's an add-on to the income for sure. Um, of course, it's, it's not what I would love it to be, which would be full-time, you know, employment income where I could just say, this is my full-time job. And, you know, I don't think about or care about anything else, but that's not the case. So I, I do... I take um, I take gigs as a as a legal uh, clerk, and I'm going to go back to school next year to become a certified paralegal because I'm good at it. Um, you know, so but 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 I'll do both. You know, I'll, I'll always continue to do it because I continually want to grow the business. So I ha I basically it depends the with the rates for a studio. I basically set what it is, and then I give people and that's like a I'll give people a like a, a sum so that if I go over the hours that I think it's going to take, I'm not, I don't want people to have to be worried about that. I'm looking at the clock, you know, everybody should be relaxed when they're working on their project that this was the price. So I'm pretty good at estimating the time correctly so that I'm, you know, I'm paying for all my time. There's an occasional hour that, you know, I didn't budget in, but you know, you want the client to be happy. That's important because then they can come back and make biz repeat business. So so that's so that's how the studio work goes and then when I do performances I'll I'll say a number and I'll based on their reaction <laughs> I might have to adjust it. You know? So sometimes I'll say is that in your budget and they'll say, "Oh yeah, it's totally fine." And then I go, "Oh, I should have asked for more." You know? Or you know, that's just right. I basically won't perform for less than $200 at this point. So that's like the bottom um, because I, I, I schlep, I take a lot of, I take professional equipment, you know, I'm on my own sound system. Also, I come with, you know, mics and speakers and speaker stands and a mixer and it's a ton of schlepping. Um, and then it could go up to, you know, close to a thousand depending on, on the venue and, and the type of place that's paying and, you know, and thank God I perform pretty often. So that's really great. I think for for a woman performing only for women, I think of myself as super successful because I do it all the time. I really have gigs all the time. So even if my income isn't where I want it to be, um, I still I still think of myself as very successful because I am working a lot. So thank God. Wow. I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about what you just said. Okay. Because <laughs> on, on one hand, I feel like it's so low. You're you're, they don't need a sound person because you do everything yourself. Right. You're doing the traveling. You're doing the entertaining, and you, you play everything. And you're doing the sound, and you're doing the speaking or well, singing, and you're right. you're bringing so much value. Um, people are getting away with two hundred dollars. I mean, I I'm embarrassed. I only do that. I only do that if it's a, if it's a, a repeat. If I know it's there's repeat performances coming from it. Like there's a contract. Ish. Or some sort of commitment of an there's, ongoing. There's like it's going to be in place, you know, where I'm going to be getting consistent gigs from them, you know. So when I break it down in terms of the time that I'm spending on the gig, it's it works out where it's comparable to my studio time, you know, which is fifty an hour. So, you know, I am earning the same. It's just a different, you know. So so that makes me feel better. But that's I only do that in the case of a you know, of a repeat, you know, ongoing performance situations. When it's when it gets to you know single performances that someone's calling me down for a party, it's it's you know double that. So then it's then it makes those you know less you know for the lower paying gigs okay because I'm getting paid 
more for other gigs, which I end up getting from the repeat gigs because you get more exposure and people see you. And I just, here's a nice little tip. I just made up my new business cards last night and I made a bunch of them as business magnets, business card magnets. I felt like that's a, you know, business cards get lost, but people use those magnets. So they I'll stick around. Good. Yes, that's cute. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk about what's next for you and what are you planning? What are your career goals? My career goals are to keep doing what I'm doing more and more. I also really, I'm really interested in helping other acts get stage time. I have a woman who I'm bringing to, to the Kim Turnheim next week. Uh, her name is Lindsay Blaschka, and she has a voice that did actually make me cry when I heard it because it's so gorgeous. And I'm really not into like slow songs or, you know, that, that type. But this, this woman, I was so, she came in to record by me. She wanted to make a, uh, an album for herself, just a few songs, just for posterity. And her voice made me cry. So I was like, I have to work with you. So we're, we're working on an act together. So I'm bringing her up. So I'd like to just increase my, my performance, uh, my performance time and, you know, how often I do it. And I, I just finished a, a CD for homeschooling mothers. It's, it's morning davening. So that I have to market now and get out there. Um, it's really nice. It has like a 12 minute Shimona Esri on there. It's all using tunes from like bass Yaakov's. I have, I had a girl come in and I recorded her for most of it because when I sing, I definitely sound conservative. <laughs> It's just something to the quality of your voice. Like this girl grew up from, she's from this neighborhood and, and she doesn't have a heavy like Yiddish accent or anything, but there's just something that you, it's intangible that you can't identify. That's like, she sounds like a legit, you know, from her birth person. And I don't. So I do some of them, but then when I sing, when I, but it's just like, mm, I don't like myself on it really, but she's the main highlight. So that, that's something, that's a project I'm working on now. I'm working on a song that my daughter wrote. She's nine. And she's the cutest. And the song is called Yellow is My Favorite Color. Um, I'm, so I'm basically working toward a new album because I have tons of tons of songs that I have to produce now. So, And average, it, how long does it take you to produce a song? It's so hard to say. Uh, cause, well, children's songs. I mean, like, uh, it's such a hard question to answer because there is the writing of it and then there's the recording of it and then there's going back and doing it again because you didn't like the way it came out you know so it's it's hard it's a hard question to answer because it's a process and every song is different right i mean you know and and like what is considered part of the production like you know is it the writing is that included like that could take you know we wouldn't include the writing i would just include the recording studio time the recording studio time with well, mixing I, I guess Oh, plus mixing. I mean, I guess when when I give it when I when I'm trying to estimate for a client, I I'll do like an hour per instrument. Let's say it gives me enough time to, you know, work out the parts, make mistakes, correct the mistakes. Uh, so this song has drums, keyboard, bass, uh, and you use all the instruments live. I like to. Yeah, except now I have I have to I have to train myself like I was saying before to to learn how to write drum parts that aren't live. Uh, you know, so just so it's more polished and professional. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Then then mixing, sometimes I I I skip out and I'll just send it to Fiverr, which is the greatest thing ever. Do you I, use Fiverr? I do that all the time. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It's the best. It's the best. Maybe 7 hours, I don't know. So super cool. I wanted to just end with um, just any reflections. I know your mother passed away in the last year, and that yeah. must have been a huge life change for you. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear any reflections or anything you'd like to share about that, maybe how it's influenced your music or your artistic career or your life in general. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I guess... My, well, I think I got, I got the lion's share, if not all of my ability to 
sing, compose, write, be funny. It's all for my mom. So, you know, every time I do something like that, it's like a, you know, it's close for her. It's like, I got that from her. So that, that feels great. It's like a really beautiful way to honor her. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm so sorry about your loss. Thank you. And just, it came up before, but I forgot to bring that up. With performances, do you? How does it work with life, family, work balance in terms of leaving your kids? And I used to always get babysitters. Now my the oldest kids that I have at home are fourteen. I have two fourteen year olds. They're twins. Oh, and they love to get paid to babysit, and they're they would do it even without pay. So I leave the house, I give instructions, and I go. Got it. And I'm a single mom at this right now. So. Oh wow. Yeah. I don't even have backup like that. Although I am dating someone very seriously. And yeah, he actually moved to Passaic from Dallas, Texas for me. And he's looking for a job. And as soon as he has, you know, a good job in place, we'll get engaged and married right away as far as I'm concerned, as far as we're both concerned. That's really I'm wonderful. Not, thank you. So I'm not like a super single mom anymore because I do have him and he does. He helps me a ton. So that's really great. Wow. Yeah. So it was so great having you on the show. If there's anything you wish you had told yourself or knew when you were younger or starting out, what would that be? I would say don't listen to any negativity uh, and just go for it. Just do it. If you love it, just enjoy it for the sake of loving it. And then hopefully, you know, other people will pick up on the joy and want to be part of that. And it should just increase for you and for everybody. Yeah. What do you hate most about your industry or the business? To be honest, I don't feel I'm part of it enough to even have an opinion about it. What I'm do just you mean? like <laughs> you're I so active. I just I know, but I'm just doing it like almost in a bubble. Like Yeah, the the I mean not about the business, about this industry that, you know, what are the most frustrating parts for you? Um I maybe it sounds naive, but I I don't come up with that. I just do my thing and then I mean, it's frustrating not to have more gigs, I guess. Like, I'd like to be called more for gigs. Uh, yeah. I guess I guess, can maybe convincing people that, like, they need this or should want this, but you can't really get involved with that. Like, other people recognize that, like, oh, you're, a, you're an awesome entertainer, right? And I'm having a party. Like, come. Or they don't, you know? So I guess I pretty much just focus on the positive stuff. I don't really think about negativity so much no but it's also no. your one woman minute, show I... you do everything the marketing the production the the sound the yeah and marketing, I'm, marketing i'm like i'm still stuck in like 1999 I, I can't seem to force myself when i'm at a gig to just do a little you know high school like selfie and be like Hi guys, here I am at La Isha in Lakewood performing for the Kim Paterans. You know, I just don't remember to do that stuff because I'm busy like packing up equipment, you know? So I haven't gotten like, and I don't have any presence basically on social media, which I know is like dinosaur age of me. So I have to get, I have to get up with that stuff. Just, you know, because when I do post stuff, I have all these girls from camp you know, these teeny boppers, like liking it. And I'm like, oh, I guess that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so, I guess that's frustrating is trying to keep up with social media. I'm totally not. So maybe I'll go to Fiverr for that and see what they have for me. Great idea. You're such a problem solver. I love it. And you're so quick and unemotional about it. So how can people find you and reach out to you and book you? They can go to my website, ilanagreedspan.com. It's Ilana with an E. Or they could go to my other website for songwriting, which is songjustforyou.com. That's song singular, songjustforyou.com. And they could email me from there, from either of those places. Um, I am on Instagram, ilana.greenspan. And we'll post Instagram. the links. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you so much for being on the show, Lana. This was really great. Thanks, Francesca. Thanks so much. And as promised, my big announcement for you is that starting June, we will have one episode of Arts and Entertainers a month and one episode of No More Silence a month. And 
but to make it more special, we are also transitioning into representing all genders, so the Jewish entertainment and arts industry at large. And in addition, we'll be having features at the end of each episode. And I hope you will enjoy the new changes. They did come from a lot of research, experience, and COVID did add a lot to it also. But yeah, things will be changing. I think it's going to make it for the better. I will still be available and interacting with you on social media. Please don't forget about The Francisca Show. And yeah, stay tuned. We'll be here twice a month for you. So for the next two weeks, we will have two different No More Silence episodes. One will be a regular storytelling style No More Silence episode, and one will be an interview with Shana Aronson, who's the COO of Jewish Community Watch. I think those two episodes are very important, uh, and they discuss important topics. Also, they have been pre-recorded for months ago, so I just want to get them out. I don't want you to have to wait another month for it. And then we will start with a new program starting June. So much for listening until the end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please make sure to check this podcast out on your podcast app if you need to figure out how to do that if you have an android you need to download a podcast app or spotify or stitcher if you have an iphone then you should already have the podcast app downloaded to your phone called podcasts and then you search for the francisca show while you're there please make sure to subscribe also you can follow me on facebook and instagram also join the artpreneur facebook group And if you'd like to schedule a strategy session with me or a discovery call to see how you can transition from being a hobbyist into a businesswoman or how to just simply grow your business, then I'd love to speak to you. You can reach out by emailing me at franciscak at gmail.com. K is spelled K-A-Y. And of course, through Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Francisca Show, a JewishCoffeeHouse.com podcast. And we'll see you next time.